Chapter 13, Men of the Mississippi, Sentinels of the Crossroads. Sentinel usually means like a tower or a pillar. It's something to mark the trail. And we've been following men. There she is, looking out over the river. Sentinels at the crossroad. Min was once more in the water. After sloshing in skim milk all summer, she found the water stuff quite thin. She swam, yet her nose didn't bump barrel staves. No more did she scramble in circles. But she was so fat, she tired easily, and she stopped. Then she was hungry. Her eyes peered blankly. No food, no chunks of tomato, cabbage, chicken, pork fat, trimmings of beef, no fishes. Not even a smell. Min sank at the thought to the bottom. Then she remembered. Snuggling herself into the mud, she let it bury her. Only her mouth was above it, wide open. Her smooth tongue wiggled like a fat worm, and a fish dived at it, and Min was eating again. Min gave into the river. She went along. She saw bluffs at Old Lake Pippin, and Marquette had seen an Indian monster painted on the air rocks. But men knew only about the rocks. A wind slammed against her then. She fought back to safe deep channel. Alton, Illinois came toward her with a noise and confusion, but vibrations no longer bothered her. Then it happened. Men rolled and churned through another dam. This was men's last dam. Though more dams would be built on the river, this was men's last step down the upper Mississippi stairs. She did not know this. She was in a daze for eight more miles. She did not notice new silt in her river. Min's northern river was being joined by a western river of plains and rocky mountains. It smelled of cottonwood, willow, buffalo grass, and sage, but the main smell was mud. Big muddy. The wild Missouri was teaming up with old Mississippi, yet each was cautious. Green waters hugged the eastern bank. Yellow waters held to the west, with men swimming in and out between the colored strands. In another mile, the currents and colored mingled, and Min's river turned golden brown. Fat Min was only a small bead between two colored cords, as the thick side line from the west was spliced to the main hook and line. Here the green northern upper Mississippi ended, and for the next 200 miles, Min would travel a wider, muddier, double-thick line, the middle Mississippi. Then the broad Ohio would add its eastern line, and a braided triple-strand lower Mississippi would flow to the Gulf. There's an old-fashioned paddle boat. The middle Mississippi scrawled the letter Z with St. Louis, Missouri at the top and Cairo, Illinois at the bottom. The Z marked a crossroads, the crossing place of the two giant water highways. Countless people had traveled west from the east coast, starting by boat, then walking over the Appalachian Ranges, then drifting down the Ohio, paddling up the middle Mississippi, pushing west up the Missouri, Indians, trappers, traders, miners, settlers had followed this trail, the Great East-West Water Trail, crossing the Great North-South Water Trail of the Middle Mississippi. Ancient mound builders once lived at these crossroads. Along the Middle Mississippi, they heaped their monuments, some of them quite huge, such as the Cohokia Mounds near East St. Louis. Like those ancient hill shapers, the soil-cutting rivers leave mounds, shapes of animals and birds, oddly crumpled outline of mysterious beatings, magic sentinels of crossroads. The middle Mississippi had carved itself into a magic river bear, balancing on its nose. St. Louis and other cities surrounded the heel of its rear foot. The city of Cairo clings to the fur of the lower jaw. The Ohad gives him front legs and old lake forms his eyes, while his round ear is tipped by Cape Gerardo. Mid left the Missouri, following the bear's rear foot some 15 miles to the middle of St. Louis. She clung to the flat stones, paving the waterfront. She sensed a haze of tall buildings at the top of the long slope. A far-off boy walked towards her along the bank, where the river town had grown into a huge city. It had seen the fur trade. It had seen the start of the Santa Fe to the southwest. Lewis and Clark settling out to explore the unknown northwest. Mormons going to Utah. Settlers moving in covered wagons to Oregon. Gold seekers bound to California or Colorado. Min saw only the boy. Larger now. No ghost stood beside her. No Indians, Frenchmen, Spaniards, mountain men, and buckskin. No blue-cad soldiers or red-shirted miners. No buffalo hunters. 
Stage drivers, cowboys, Irish layer, road tracks, no forest of steam stacks crowding their shores. Towboats rode by doing their work of old time steamboats. Nobody came but the little boy, thinking of turtle soup. And men left. This is a drawing of the Eads Bridge. It was the first bridge built across the Mississippi at St. Louis. And it still stands there today, even though it's very old. The Middle Mississippi held much magic. There was the Eads Bridge of Iron dating from after the Civil War days. Folks once said, that self-taught Eads boy, he can think and do th engineering things no one's ever dared. But his wild scheme for raising sunken cargoes brought him a fortune. His Eads jetties made the river clean its own muddy mouth. Now men in St. Louis drifted under soaring iron of his dream bridge. A century ago, there was other magic, too. Artists drifted down to the river making sketches. At St. Louis, they painted long panoramas from their drawings, rolls of painted cloth to be slowly unwound before audiences. These bright-colored, ground-up silts of earth and minerals mixed with oils were smeared on cotton cloth and shown in cities of America and Europe. Countless people who would never see the river itself watched such magic roll past as though they gazed from the docks of the river steamboat. For three years, Mirren left her yearly magic gift along the middle Mississippi, laying her eggs in sun-warm soil. At one old wooden island, a troop of painted terrapin watched as she came ashore to nest near a blown-up steamboat. Over 5,000 such steamboats had been wrecked on the middle river alone. These shifty river characters had robbed Illinois of land to bribe Missouri with it, or the other way around. The town of St. Genevieve, once on the bank, now sent inland, nearby St. Mary's, cut off from the river, now lay four miles from the main channel. Men walked on silted stones, which once had been part of Cascacaya, important French river frontier town. Opposite Grand Tower and the river bare shoulder, Men passed a towering rock. Long streaks across it marked the sinking levels of an ancient island sea. Men passed Cape Girardeau, famous old river city on the hill of the Bear's Ear. But the Bear's Eyebrow, men's thousand-mile-long Dug Ditch River, ended. As an old-timer might say, right here at Commerce, Missouri, Paul Bunyan quit plowing the giant furrow, and he had his blue box Abe let out for... Bemidji in the north woods again. Walls of the ditch were dwindling away. From here to the gulf, man-made levees would take the place of bluffs along the western banks. The magic river bear stared down at a new kind of river. Chapter 13, Men of the Mississippi.